everybody and welcome back to World Wildlife Journeys with Russell Gammon. Uh, today I'm joined in my studio by a man half a world away. His uh, name is Dogesh Singh. He is our man in India for World Wildlife Journeys. He accompanies all of our tours there and he's a professional guide there and um, naturalist. So Dogesh joining us from halfway around the world. Thanks for uh, making the time. Hi, Russell. Great to connect. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. Uh, we, were just, we were just saying before we started the recording that it was almost a year ago to the day that I was with you on safari and then COVID came along and uh, changed all our plans. Yes. Eh? Yeah, completely. <laughs> I remember that the scare that we had and uh, how we had to move everybody back to their home safely and uh, come back home safely before this lockdown happened. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. It's going to stay with uh, me for a long time for sure. Well, you know what? The thing, the thing I always say is, look, you know, these things are going to happen when you travel, and um, you know, I stand by what I always say. If you have a good guide, then when things go wrong, it's less of a problem than if you don't have a somebody who knows what they're doing. You know, somebody who can make decisions and just say, look. This is what we need to do for your safety and it's not always related to animals sometimes it's just a case of looking at the political situation sometimes it's you know in this case it was a it was a, a disease situation and just saying look there's no point in us carrying on with this it's not going to work so yeah hopefully we will uh, be reunited again in 2022 yep. And be able to yes. go back on safari and look for the tigers again. Um, yeah. I don't imagine that they, I, don't, I don't imagine that they've missed us very much. They've probably just been getting on with their lives and enjoying a bit of peace and quiet. True, true, true. I think um, they're still getting their share of tourists, uh, but most um, it's the local tourism which is keeping the parks afloat at the moment. So, um, tourism is going on, and tigers are there, and they're just waiting for the overseas clients, you know, to visit them. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully this, uh, this little story that we're going to do today on tiger conservation will gin up a little bit of interest. So, give us, the, give us a snapshot of what tiger conservation looks like um, in India today. Uh, where are you guys at? Because you have made some very impressive strides in the last couple of years um, since everybody woke up to the fact that these cats were in decline. And I'm right in saying, I think, that India now houses the, the, the largest share of tigers um, in the wild. Um, but yes. give us a give us a bit of a snapshot of what's happened in the last couple of years and uh, where you guys are today with your tiger population. Right. Uh, so I think I have to go back uh, more than a couple of years actually. Uh, so this whole uh, alarm started uh, getting sounded in the year two thousand and eight. Uh, when uh, the Tiger Census, which uh, updated its methodology by including camera traps, uh, realized that uh, there are only 1,400 tigers left in the wild. So earlier, uh, this uh, census method involved a lot of this Pogmark uh, you know, Pogmark methodology. So there used to be a lot of misrepresentation of the numbers uh, across uh, the country. So in 2008, they realized that uh, they are actually uh, at half, less than half the number they started with in uh, 1973 when the Project Tiger started. And then uh, the conservation methods and the counting methodology and protection measures definitely uh, were put into better place. And uh, since then, we have not actually looked back on the numbers going down. So they have been increasing constantly. And uh, right now, since 2008, uh, the numbers are right now close to 3,000. Wow. So if we go through the uh, St. Petersburg uh, Convention, the Tiger Summit that happened in 2010, and the goal was to achieve the doubling of numbers by 2022. So India has uh, got the numbers doubled by 2018 census. So that's a great achievement. Now, the, 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 the thing for most people that probably don't appreciate this is, 
there's a there's a kind of a very strong um, perception that any animal that is endangered is endangered because rather like the panda, there's something very complicated and convoluted about their breeding biology and that they just, you know, they, they, but, but that is not the case with tigers. Yes. You can manufacture a million of these things. I mean, I saw a statistic the other day, I don't know the veracity of it, saying that there's more tigers in, in America in captivity than there are in the wild in the whole of the world. Now, I yes. don't know if that's true, but it's <laughs> not beyond belief because they are, you know, they will breed. The real issue is finding space for them to live in. Um, and in a exactly. country like yeah. India, that's as populous as India, that has such a fast growing population, it is, um, that must be really at the heart of this challenge. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely uh, a big challenge. And uh, just to, uh, you know, take, tell you some figure about related to that. Uh, India has, let's say, you know, 2.5% of the world's total land mass and 4% uh, of the freshwater resources. Uh, but 16% of world's human and cattle, they reside in the country. Wow. So, and uh, luckily, we still have 8% uh, of biodiversity. And just talking of tigers, let's say around 75 to 80% of world's uh, wild tigers are still living in India. Yeah. And similar numbers, uh, let's say for uh, elephants and uh, other, uh, let's say, you know, there are 500 plus lions left uh, in the wild, 3,000 plus uh, single horned rhinos, and 30,000 elephants in the wild in this yeah. small space. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that yeah. way, so it is still is uh, a big space. Yes. Yes. In spite of the limited space, uh, things are still uh, uh, looking good. Uh, but that's not uh, something uh, that will look good uh, considering the uh, rate at which the population is increasing, especially when the forest uh, uh, forests are getting fragmented, especially by structures like road or mining or, or railway lines uh, and expanding urban limit or even rural limit. So that's a big challenge that we are facing now for the tiger conservation. And then, and then on the back of that, the the logical kind of follow on from that is that you're going to have human wildlife conflict yes uh, we not we it's a everyday thing actually especially in areas which are close to the wildlife areas uh, wildlife reserves and national parks where conservation measures are quite good though we are seeing an increase in conflict because the numbers of animals are increasing um, uh, let's say tigers you, you know as uh, they are fast breeders but other animals are once they get a secure ground they breed also quite comfortably and a lot of crop damage and human animal conflict in terms of like, uh, you know, uh, deaths uh, due to these conflicts are also cattle lifting. So all these things are also increasing in India uh, in a big way. Yeah, yeah. I watched a, an absolutely fascinating documentary, which was uh, focused on the leopards of Mumbai which was just yes. mind blowing for me. You know, you, yeah, you yeah. know, you like we have leopards in Africa, so you know that they're in urban spaces and you know that they're on the slopes of Table Mountain. And, and you know, I mean, a friend of mine had a, a tussle with a leopard that jumped over the fence and tried to, tried to carry away his Labrador puppy, which yeah. was, which was, um, you know, he had to go and beat this leopard off and chase it away. And the Labrador puppy required a whole raft of stitches. But the really funny thing about it was, you know, Labradors are these like very mellow, relaxed dogs. And this thing was a Labrador through and through. It was completely mellow and relaxed. But if it saw like a domestic tabby cat, it just yeah. lose its mind and just wow. turn into Cujo. <laughs> because it said, hey, I remember PTSD, your yeah. cousin <laughs> gave me a hiding. <laughs> and this dog would just, I mean, it was like a, it was like someone had thrown a switch and it would just turn into this raging beast. <laughs> so it certainly remembered what that cat's cousin had done to it. But yeah, I was amazed to watch those leopards cruising down through the streets of Mumbai. And so it's not it's not sort yeah. of in, in back alleys that it's past the Gucci shop and past the Ferrari dealership. And it's like 
it was insane to watch. Um, but there is there is been recognition of the idea that this fragmentation is a is a, a major problem and they have been yes. uh, there has been a, a lot of effort put towards creating corridors even so far as the government going and buying land back from people to expand the parks and to try and link them is that right yes so in some of the landscape uh, this is very actively uh, being done because in the last census what they realized is that uh, there is a significant population of tigers living outside the protected areas so protected areas are now islands, basically, because due to urbanization and uh, due to these linear, linear infrastructures uh, cutting through the landscape. So uh, this corridor uh, building movement is something that is uh, really a priority right now for the government and the NGOs who are generally involved with conservation. So they're trying to connect as much as uh, landscape that is possible because historically, more or less, uh, the animal pathways are known. Only thing is that they have to secure these pathways uh, you know, from the human presence and uh, let's say, you know, build uh, these highways with underpasses or overpasses uh, so that the animal movement is not uh, restricted. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that is something that people are investing now. Uh, they have realized that, you know, the PAs are all taken care, but uh, the corridors need to be secured now. Yeah. And that's interesting because you guys in India, you're building highways at a tremendous rate now, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I've, yes. I've I've seen the change since I, you know, and I we haven't been coming there long, but boy, you can, it's like a different country every time I visit. You know, it's uh, amazing yeah. with the infrastructure that's going in there. So it's great that they uh, that they are taking cognizance of that. Um, yes, yes. And yes. I'm interested to know. That is something now, you guys also have been as close as you are to China. You know the 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 one of the driving forces we know for you know tiger the demise of tigers has been uh, the yes. poaching of them for the the illicit wildlife trade specifically for making tiger bone wine is that a is that a big problem for india's population or is it something that's really more of a problem in in uh, neighboring countries uh, that is still a significant uh, problem i would say for india i think 40 percent plus uh, tiger deaths are responsible uh, due to poaching so apart but that's not a significant number because 40 percent is not something um, uh, it's, it's alarming but it's not that alarming had it been like 80 percent or something then yeah um, there are other reasons why the tigers are dying so poaching pressure is definitely there especially in the areas which are doing well uh if there is a spillover especially because let's say these protected areas are taken care but the moment these tigers step out of these protected areas to look for new territory or uh, uh you know just to disperse that's when uh they are uh you know and they're in danger yeah so that is definitely there we cannot rule out uh, the poaching uh, syndicates and the poaching activities uh, uh, responsible for decreasing number of tigers but uh, the, the moment they are stepping out of these protected areas definitely they are facing a big problem big so problem. so if that's only uh, a small percentage of the uh, fatalities what is the what is the biggest uh, what is number one I know number one I would say like yeah 40 percent uh, like coaching is definitely one of the high numbers and the other are like contributing factors like the moment uh, they are stepping out of the protected areas they are facing a uh, problem like human animal conflict if they're like on a regular cattle lifting mode then uh, poisoning of carcasses are happening and that's why that's one of the reason then uh, electric yeah, wires uh, which are generally set out uh, to target smaller animals or snares which are uh, targeted for smaller herbivores uh, they are falling into trap and then road accidents and uh, yeah so these are again some of the big, bigger factors that are yeah. uh, responsible for that yeah. i mean it's interesting because different you know these different these different large predators they face different challenges i mean for us we have uh, a bit like your doll we have a the african wild dog um, yes. And that's a pack animal, and they get you know if you have a highway anywhere there near them, on a cold night that tar is warm, and they go and lie in the middle of the road, oh, and they yeah. just they just don't know what a car is. 
and a truck will come along and just wipe out a whole pack of them in a you know in a single incident so you know it's it's amazing how with different predators there's different scenarios where and and for those wild dogs man road deaths is the leading cause of 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 their demise you know they just how to teach them not to lie in the middle of the road. I mean, what they've started doing is collaring the alpha male and alpha female with reflective. So the collars they put on them is to track them, the radio tracking collars, but they've started putting that reflective tape onto the collar, right. sewing it on there so that at least, you know, at least two of the dogs are, are going to have, you know, maybe going to be spotted, maybe going to cause the, the, the truck to slow down, but yeah, it's a it's a massive massive problem, and in terms of tiger conservation in the region, um, because yeah. there are different subspecies in 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 different little corners of Southeast Asia. Um, yes. What does the picture look like, kind of outside of India? Outside of India, uh, I would say there is a uh, quite a bit of pressure on the tigers, uh, definitely, especially due to the poaching factors and the habitat fragmentation and especially in areas uh, where uh, there is a big uh, push towards uh, let's say uh, you know these monocultures coming up especially uh, yeah. you know, single crops uh, getting promoted and these forests getting uh, cut uh, because of that they're facing a big pressure i think india is still the place where one can see a wild tiger uh, yeah. pretty easily compared to the rest of our neighboring countries yeah and uh, yeah, so that's that's still a challenge. The, the, there, that, I think that is, is that is that yeah. something that the Indian government has now woken up to the fact that this is this is a you know a, a potential source of revenue for the country. Um, do you think that's starting to become? You know, I know that I know that you know anybody who takes a look at the shelf behind you, or anybody that travels around anywhere in India knows that. That you know, tigers have got a very, very powerful place in yeah. um, in in Indian culture. You know, so there's there's a there's a sense of national pride there about them, and a and a um, you know a love of them and an awe of them that's that's there throughout the culture. Um, but I'm wondering if if that's now been augmented with a bit of kind of practical where the Indian government's looking at them saying, well, hang on a second, you know, these are iconic animals, they are kind of our, our totem, but actually, they could earn us some serious money as well. Yes, tourism, wildlife tourism has got a big push, especially, you know, that India has like 29 states, and I think somewhere around 18 states have tiger. So, uh, there are uh, really conscious efforts, especially uh, the states which have good number of tigers, let's say Madhya Pradesh, uh, Karnataka, Uttarakhand, uh, these are having some of the highest number of tigers in the country and they are pushing this wildlife tourism in a big way where uh, that's the only way to showcase uh, uh, these animals and uh, get money out of it for the local community who in turn can have a good uh, uh, you know, intention towards the wildlife. So, uh, Tigers are very closely related, even in our mythology or religion. Uh, uh, tigers, uh, tigers are a big part of it. It's just that uh, they have to be monetized in a way, so that people see there is economic benefits rather than just sentimentality involved with it. Because yeah, we, we need to find some to the population's uh, economy and uh, their livelihoods. Yeah, I mean, I, I always explain to people that that you know the 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 fact that the politicians see a benefit in having wildlife is a very very powerful force for conservation yeah. anywhere in the world. Um, and I always say, look, you know, the that the people kind of get hung up about, well, you know, how much of the money from the it's always the argument about the hunting industry. Well, how much of the money actually makes it down to grassroots level? And I'm inclined to say to people, look, it's actually academic. What's important is that the politicians see the benefit because then they are the ones who are ultimately going to maintain the status quo. And, and I think you and I had this, uh, this conversation about, um, you know, how, how many local uh, families around the park are involved in 
supplying the vehicles that do the game drives and and what an incredibly powerful force that has become for conservation because when they get shut out of the park there's a lot of them and they get a hold of their local representative and they make their displeasure known and it has this feedback effect that you know even the 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 guys who are in charge of the forestry department who which is a very very powerful bureaucracy in india they they are finding themselves you know increasingly uh, being sort of dragged along with the whole ecotourism thing it might not yeah. necessarily be something that they were enthusiastic about at first but the power is is the power of people the power of democracy the power of of when people feel that they have a stake in something when they feel that they they're benefiting somehow becomes an incredibly powerful force doesn't it yes exactly i just to narrate a small incident regarding this so i come from odisha which is a state uh, which is actually suffering from uh, lowering of tiger numbers over the recent years and we are very close to madhya pradesh which is definitely right now the best state uh, to visit for tigers and they have the highest number of tigers and in a recent effort a couple of years back there was an attempt to get some tigers from madhya pradesh to odisha to one of its tiger reserves where the numbers were going down and uh, what happened was that uh, uh, the reserve in my state people around it were not uh, informed or sensitized regarding how the presence of tiger is going to affect them or improve their livelihood or give them opportunity to explore uh, and uh, uh, you know economic benefits out of this whole thing uh so they got the tigers so they got two tigers and this was released uh, in the tiger reserve and uh, because uh, of various of reasons uh, these tigers uh, ended up one of them ended up killing a couple of people in the tiger reserve and uh, there was a huge backlash and uh, people just wanted these tigers to be out of the uh, reserve but yeah. whereas at the same time in the state uh, in madhya pradesh where these tigers came from people over there didn't want to let these tigers go out of their state because they realized the economic benefits of the tigers and they said that why are you taking our tigers uh, away so that's where the mentality you can see how it uh, was different in two different states which are very close to each other so unless people realize or uh, you know the forest department and the politicians uh, they uh, make the people understand and first they have to understand forest department of course they understand but the politicians involved they have to understand how it is going to affect uh, you know, the local uh, livelihood and the conservation scenario in the country uh, it's very difficult to uh, get these tigers to a better position yeah i mean it's a it's a it's an interesting thing because they you know in their nature they are more typical cats they're more like leopards um but they're big i mean anybody who's been there to see them they are they're unbelievably large those big males are you know a, a big male lion is a big cat but those big male tigers man they are absolutely huge and uh you know once they wander outside the reserve they ain't a lot to eat except as you said cows and people and they not uh you know lions lions having grown up with masai and that uh, i think they've been pretty well uh, you know i think that we as as a species used to scavenge off of lion kills so when lions see us right. coming they 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 get up and they move off even if they're on a kill you can fairly easily chase them off you know when they see us coming they used to that scenario oh boy here come the humans we're about to lose our meal and that's the relationship that we had with lions i don't think we ever had that relationship with tigers they're not they don't have that same instinctive fear of humans so you're talking about a cat that's bigger than a lion number 1 and number 2 they're going two, to put up a fight number 2 it's an ambush predator like a leopard Yes. so it used to yes. hunting from an ambush so it sees something coming it just goes immediately into that position and then number 3 they're not as afraid of people i mean there's a there's a is a very very unusual scenario for an african lion to become a man eater it's it's happened it's obviously very well documented but there's always 
a reason behind that animal becoming a man eater. They're, they're, they're old, they're injured, they're, there's something about they cannot hunt normally, so they become a man eater. Yeah. But with tigers, that's not the same way. Those things, uh, those things like to eat people, they're crazy. <laughs> I would not say that. I would mindly disagree with this. Thing. Yes, I think the same reasons uh, dictate uh, a tiger to become a man eater. But then let's say for a, uh, if there is a female which has got into this habit, then the cubs definitely lose that fear. And uh, then they can be a potential man eater in the future because they know that man's, um, men are easy targets. And that used to happen in the time when, uh, you know, these communications or let's say in these village lightings and or, you know, dense forests so were dominating the landscape. You know, when it was quite dark and a lot of people were still living and then you used to get a lot of these man-eating stories, man eater stories. But mostly I would say that uh, they are still man-killers and given an opportunity, they will definitely eat a bit. Somebody who has uh, got this uh, fear out of their system at a very young age, then there's yeah. always a chance. You, that, you, you, you're absolutely right about that. It's not, you know, we, all, we always say that about... the. Threat. The old, the old adage used to be, oh, they've developed a taste for eating humans, and it's not. What I've always said is that they, they just, they, they, they have an instinctive fear of us, and once they've overcome it once, yes. and they realize yeah. just, just how weak we actually are. You know, we have, we have this aura, thanks to, you know, two thousand, you know, two million years of evolution, where our hominid ancestors were much fiercer than we actually are today, um, and you know, so modern humans are are, uh, yeah, we we are not uh, we're not that difficult to handle, and once they learn that, you're right, they they're a lot less fearful of us. They're like, ah, this isn't such a bad thing after all. Yes. Yeah, formidable creatures, eh? Tell me, um, just in closing, won't you tell us a little bit about your, your other passion, which is the snow leopards? Dogesh does this amazing expedition. It's not for the faint-hearted. He offered to take me, and I said to him, yeah, well, maybe after I've hit the gym and lost a couple of pounds, because he goes right up in the top of the Himalayas um, looking for Yonder, snow leopards, yeah. which are... Uh, incredible incredible creatures tell us a little bit about that expedition uh yes uh, so i i love snow leopards so that was one of the big challenge so if you want to experience uh, the conditions in which a snow leopard survives snow leopard expeditions are the best way to do it because you become one with the animal because you are living at the same uh, temperature same and you are uh, traveling in the same terrain and it's quite challenging so in the recent years, uh, one development that has happened is that a couple of lodges have come up in the landscape that has made life easier. So uh, recently I have done both the trips. I have done the camping trip, which basically camps out in the open in minus 20, minus 30 kind of uh, temperature with, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, snow around you. Okay, and, so, so, so uh, my, regular, my regular audience is getting a picture of why I didn't jump <laughs> the opportunity to go and yeah, do this. Yeah. <laughs> But there is also the other uh, way, which is more comfortable way, where you are living in a, let's say, a centrally heated lodge and uh, it's only and if going out in the vehicles, you don't have to do a lot of walking because we are talking of an altitude of 4,000 meter plus. So yeah. it's a struggle to even to talk uh, in that kind of uh, temperature. So, uh, so 4,000 kind of 4, meters for our, uh, our American guests is, uh, what, 12,000 feet, 13,000 yes. feet? 13,000 feet, yes. Oh, that's brutal. <laughs> so, uh, so we have the more comfortable way of doing that also. So, uh, uh, so what you do is basically you, you are in the landscape for let's say six nights or something. And every morning there are trackers who help you out to spot these animals because we are talking of a landscape where there is all rocks. And in these rocks, you have to find a snow leopard, which is again, the same color uh, as the rocks. So... It's a, it's a huge challenge. So there are trackers who go out in the morning and they scan the area and uh, based on the local news and previous day's news, they will uh, try to find uh, where the snow leopard would be resting. And uh, during the, just like the uh, big cats, they rest throughout the day and they're more active early in the mornings or 
late in the afternoons and that is when you can see them moving so once you know that the snow leopard is resting you uh, go near to that spot and uh, park yourselves over there use the spotting scopes uh, uh, to scan the area and to spot the leopard and once you have spotted it you basically keep watching it through the scope and generally we are talking of a distance which are more than uh, 600 uh, to up to a couple of kilometers so yeah. we need uh, the very very scopes. long distances very big spotting yes. scopes yeah, and, and we're um, lucky then, uh, just like it, yes, yes. And, yes. and now tell me, are they over the years? Are they becoming more um, habituated to people? They're becoming a little bit more relaxed with people watching them. Uh, I would say yes, uh, and also the one thing that has definitely uh, changed is that now a lot of people are looking for them. Earlier, uh, people used to frequent a couple of valleys where uh, sightings were happening, but now they have started finding the, their presence all over the landscape. And uh, as you know, recently, their numbers have increased, so they are now out of the threatened list. So uh, they are everywhere. Only thing is that once you start looking for them in a uh, good uh, area, you will definitely be lucky to find them. Yeah, I mean, the, this is true of, of, of all leopards, but... Um... It is amazing to me this uh, this this thing that you know when we start looking for them in, even in places where we didn't think that they existed we find we find these creatures. I mean, you know, one of the one of the rarest uh, creatures in southern Africa was the brown hyena, which was you yeah. know on on the critically endangered list. They've now found a whole bunch of them living on a mine dump in Johannesburg. Really? Yeah, there's brown hyenas running around in the middle of Johannesburg. They're just so, you know, they're just so secretive, DK, that, that nobody knew. And then, and then now they're also finding them, they've also found them with camera traps in the lower Zambezi Valley, which they didn't know that they were. Oh. So the, the range, you know, what we knew of, this is the animal's range, suddenly we're going, well, hang on a second, actually, these things are all over the place and yes. and uh, much more widespread than we realized. This is, uh, you know, E.O. Wilson's uh, book, Half the Earth. Um, what he's advocating is not that we kind of build a wall along the equator and give the southern half of it to wildlife. That's not what he's advocating. What he's saying is, you know, you have these urban spaces and you have wild animals living there, and it's just a case of us becoming more tolerant towards having that wildlife in our space, because we have tended to want through the process of civilization to kind of draw a line and say, well, wild animals must stay there, and you know, we're gonna stay here. And the reality is we need to have a much greater tolerance for them you know, if they do, and if and if we create that tolerance, they will move into the suburbs. But you know, like my friend with his Labrador, there's consequences that we have to learn to live with, and you know, yes. that's that's where it all becomes a little bit complicated. DK, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you. Um, it's been wonderful to see your Same face. I, I see you and I both have a few COVID <laughs> yes. pounds to shed um, when the going when, when we get back <laughs> on the road again. You need to go and climb some more yes. mountains, and uh, you're probably going to have to carry me up a couple. Um, but if you ever find the snow leopards at low altitude next to a you know luxury lodge, you should definitely give me yes. a call, especially if they're yeah, yeah, yeah. enough to yes. photograph. Definitely, we can plan something on that and. It's happening. Uh -huh. Means it, it's not that difficult animal to find anymore. So yeah, yeah. I tell you what, it's a, it's a bit like the jaguars of South America. You know, once people started to realize that there was money in them, then suddenly it became well. You know, why are we going to farm cattle? Let's farm jaguars because you know they're actually more valuable. Um, and I think oh. that's what it is. Is kind of. You know, that's that's always been the hope for ecotourism is that it that it creates a value chain that um, enhances 
and incentivizes people to to make space for wildlife yes dk thanks for joining me right. i really appreciate it yes. it was great to see you on board for everybody else thanks for joining us um i look forward to having you join us again next week um where we'll be talking uh yeah probably a little bit about uh maybe hunting safaris if i can get mr charlton to come and join us so a little bit more controversial uh, i'm not sure if you'll be back out the bush yet it'll either be next week or the following week but uh, until then stay safe keep well and uh, i look forward to seeing you again soon mm -hmm.